Hello, students. Let's talk literary terms for English to turn in your workbooks to the literary terms page. You'll see the definition and maybe some examples and the word will be missing. So as we go through these, I want you to try to guess what the word is. It's kind of a fun little game that we play. See what you already know. And um, remember, these are in alphabetical order. So that might give you a little bit of a hint. All right. Uh, turning your books and I'll meet you there. Okay, literary terms. Oh, the first term is when something happens or is attributed to a different era than when it actually existed. Usually a mistake, but sometimes it's done for rhetorical effect. Do we know what that is? <laughs> If you do, you should give yourself like five gold stars because it's pretty impressive. This is called an anachronism. Anna meaning like away from, cron meaning time. It's not of the time, okay? So for example, this picture of Abraham Lincoln holding a boom box seems all well and good, but of course we know boom boxes were not invented during the time of Abraham Lincoln. And so that would be an anachronism. Um, in the play Julius Caesar, we hear one of the characters say that the clock has struck three. Um, at that point in time in ancient Rome, uh, there were no mechanical clocks, so there were no clocks striking at three, okay? Uh, and then if you've ever watched Back to the Future, you uh, may have seen that one of the characters is holding a guitar or playing a guitar when he goes back in time, um, but this guitar actually had not even been invented during the time period that he went back to. So those are all examples of anachronism. Our next phrase or word or term is the repetition of a word or a phrase at the beginning of a series of clauses or sentences. I bet you guys know this one by now. It's often seen in poetry and speeches. It's intended to provoke an emotional response in its audience. This is anaphora. Anaphora. Some people have said anaphora, but I'm pretty sure it's anaphora. <laughs> All right. Um, you can find this in Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. I have a dream that one day my four little children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. Every time he says, I have a dream, that's anaphora because he's starting the line out with the same refrain. Okay. Um, remember when we listened to Winston Churchill's uh, speech, the darkest hour speech, we will fight them on the beaches. We will fight them in the hills. All right. That was an Afra as well. We will fight. We will fight. We will fight. Uh, if you've ever read A Tale of Two Cities, if you haven't, you should. It's like one of the best books ever. I love this book. Um, it starts off with, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. Incredulity. <laughs> All right. It was, it was, it was, it was. We are comparing and contrasting Paris and London here. And so Dickens can, um, starts every sentence exactly the same. That's anaphora. All right. The next one. Oh, I put the word in there. <laughs> an aphorism. This is an aphorism. An aphorism is a universally accepted truth that's stated in a concise and to the point way. So actions speak louder than words. That's an aphorism. It's basically like, I want you to imagine like your old granny giving you words of wisdom. Okay. Or like maybe a fortune cookie. Okay. Uh, that's where you're going to find your aphorisms, the grannies and the fortune cookies. <laughs> okay. Um, maybe like you've got a wise father who, who gives you uh, good advice. Um, the, these people in your life probably are using aphorisms. Give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. So true. So true. Um, or Ben Franklin, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Ben Franklin was full of aphorisms that we use all the time. The early bird gets the worm, things like that, which is very ironic because he was kind of a party boy and did not <laughs> live the life that his aphorisms touted. So kind of interesting. Okay. Oh, maybe you already know this based on the picture. A very typical example of a certain person or thing, a prototype. Okay. Hmm. hmm. So um, this is called an archetype. Okay. And the way I remember this is the word type. Okay. Um, an archa is like people, right? We're, we're studying people, um, a type of person. Okay. So let's go over a few of these because they're really fun, actually. So for example, you have the lover. The lover is a classic type of character that is in many, many stories and archetypes. They cross cultures, they cross time periods. Um, they're really timeless characters that are universal to pretty much every culture. Um, so you've got the lover, 
the the man with the soft heart and and the kind words and and he does all the sweet things to get the girl that's the lover you've got the hero you've got the magician okay um you've got the outlaw the outlaw is like the guy who's like not gonna conform to society standards right he's like making a difference by rebelling okay uh you got the explorer like indiana jones uh you've got the sage the sage is like the wise person that has all of the good um like advice i'm trying to think of any other sages hmm can y'all think of any like maybe dumbledore from harry potter um usually like uh, older people in stories are the sages. Oh, Grandmother Willow from Pocahontas. If you've watched Grandmother or po Pocahontas, Grandmother Willow in there is the sage. Okay. Um, you've got the innocent. The innocent is the person who is just like so like child, like even if they're not a child, Tiny Tim is an innocent and he is a child, but like uh, you have Buddy the Elf and they're just so pure that you just love them because of their, their pure, unadulterated, just zest for life <laughs> and like you just want to protect them uh you've got the creator i'm thinking of the guy from back to the future the scientist but i also imagine like all of those more modern shows where you've got the one kid that's like the it guy and he's like in his dark room with like all of his computer screens around him and who the main characters are out there solving crime or fighting the battle or doing whatever they're doing out there but they always call back to the creator you know that it guy and they're like hey can you make all the stoplights green you know and the creator is like making all of these programs and things happening <laughs> um so that the main characters can do their thing uh you've got the ruler okay uh very typical usually strong dignified ruler okay uh you've got the caregiver mary poppins is a great example but there's tons of caregiver examples um one of my favorites you've got the everyman the everyman is the guy that's like not super special but he's just like so relatable you're like yeah i if i could be anyone i would be him he's just chill and uh and i get him Okay, that's the everyman. And then finally, you've got the jester, who's like the funny character, the comedic relief, sometimes making a fool of him or herself so that the story can have a comedic element. Okay, that would be in Pitch Perfect, the character Fat Amy. So, all right, a reason or a set of reasons given with which the authors aim, uh, with the aim of persuading others that an action or idea is right or wrong. This is pretty easy argument. Okay, then you've got the counter argument. That's when someone claps back at you. Okay, so you say uh, the sky is blue and someone says, well, no, at sunset, the sky is pink. Okay, that's the counter argument. Now the refutation is where I clap back at the counter argument. Okay, so it goes argument, counter argument, refutation. Okay, I'm gonna refute what they're saying, okay? These are not in order on your paper. So you need to kind of go through and find where the blanks are and fill them in, okay? Pause the video if you need to, no big deal. Okay, I came, I saw, I conquered. Ooh, that sounds familiar. We here highly resolve that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. Intentionally eliminating conjunctions for rhetorical effect. Hmm, do you remember? It means without conjunctions, which Greek root means without. You remember? A, A syndeton. I know you all got it. You were all just like yelling it at your screens, jumping up and down, just so excited that you know the answer. A syndeton is um, something that we do for rhetorical effect when we don't want to be bogged down by a bunch of conjunctions like and, but, and or. Um, we pull them out to make a point, okay? To be, like we're on a roll and you need to listen, okay? Or I mean business. I don't I don't have time for conjunctions. I don't have any doubt. This is it, <laughs> okay? I came, I saw, I conquered, okay? It's not I came, I saw, and I conquered. There's a difference. There's just a rhetorical difference. Um, Asinitin can be used for a lot of different um, effects, but it typically gives a lot of emphasis and power, okay? Okay, I love this one. <laughs> Two or more parallel clauses are inverted. Now you may be like, what? Let me show you. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. See how we inverted the clause? Uh, JFK loved to use these. He was really a good speaker and um, he used these a lot. This is called a chiasmus. 
chiasmus. Okay. I bet you didn't know there was a word for it. <laughs> you probably heard these. They're very catchy and they're super common um, and very rhetorically effective. That's why they're so common. Uh, but you may not have known the name of it. Chiasmus. Okay. If you plan to fail, you, I'm sorry. If you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. Another one from my boy, Ben man, he has so many words of wisdom. Like he was a little sketchy in his private life. I'll be honest, but oh gosh, he has so many good quotes. If you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. Okay. I don't live to work. I work to live. Okay. Um, that's kind of what people say when they're like, my life isn't all the job. I come here so that I can afford my life. My life isn't the job. My life is outside of the job. Okay. That's chiasmus. Okay. Oh, I love this one. <laughs> an informal statement, sometimes untranslatable, uh, like an idiom. Okay. That is commonly heard among a particular people group. Okay. It's like an idiom. It can contain slang. It's usually slang. Okay. So this is called a colloquialism. Okay. A colloquialism is just a phrase that's informal. It's like an idiom. We avoid these in our paper. Um, and the reason why is because a lot of colloquialisms are cliches. They're said a lot. Um, and so they're not particularly profound. They're not really uh, unique or special. And so it makes you look like you don't really have much of your own words to say. Uh, it's pretty weak, weak to use colloquialisms in your paper unless you are very skillfully adding one like in a very strategic spot. Okay. So avoid these. Okay. That's fire, bro. <laughs> Don't say that in a paper. Number one, it's too informal. And number two, it's not your words. And so it doesn't sound clever because everybody has said this maybe. Okay. A lot of people have said this. Um, if you knock it out of the park, that's a colloquialism. That means to do like an exceptionally good job. If I say, whoa, you knocked that project out of the park. That means, whoa, you did so great. Okay. It's a perfectly fun to use in your everyday speech, but avoid it in your papers. Um, I'm going to have to write you a rain check. Originally, this was when people would go to sporting events and it would start raining um, and the ballpark would write a check to the people basically saying you can come back on a sunny day and get your ticket for free because you've already paid for this ticket. Um, but now writing rain check is like, I'm busy, but I'm going to guarantee that I will spend time with you at another later date. Okay. You're the bomb. That's what we said when I was a kid. <laughs> All right. Um, so there's a colloquialism from, you know, back in my day. And then one of my favorite ones, <laughs> spill the tea, spill the tea. Y'all. All right. So, um, there are some colonialisms. Okay. Word choice. Oh, you know, this one, remember, where do we find words? What book? The dictionary. So word choice is your diction. Okay. I don't say good. I'm a 10th grader. I say excellent, amazing, wonderful, outstanding, splendid, stupendous. Okay. I don't say looked. He looked, I say gazed. That has a connotation, right? That gives you like a, a much more clear um, picture of what kind of looking is being done. I don't say look, I say inspected. All right. You see how there's so much more um, based on the word choice. You get so much more information. That's why word choice is so important. Okay. Don't just take the, the two cent words, take the $5 words because you're big kids now and you can do it. Okay. This is a short quote or a saying at the beginning of a book or a chapter intended to suggest the theme. Okay. So if an author writes a book, they may choose a quote from another person and put that quote at the beginning of their book. And that is called an epilogue. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> an epigraph, an epigraph. An epilogue is actually um, where someone writes like a foreword. Um, or like a little pre uh, preamble to a story. Um, now, some people may say, isn't this epitaph? What's the difference between epigraph and ep epitaph? An epitaph is something that's written on a tombstone. Okay. And I remember this because epitaph, t, 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 t for tombstone. Okay. Epigraph is for your book. Okay, so um, here's the epigraph from before To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, that book has lawyers in it. And so there's a quote about lawyers, The Great Gatsby. So good. When I was in high school, I could not appreciate this book at all, but I read it again as an adult and it's incredible. Um, but the book is about unrequited love. A man loves this woman and he will do anything to make just to make her happy because he loves her so much. Um, and so this is the quote that, that F. Scott, Scott Fitzgerald put at the beginning of the book. 
then wear the gold hat if that will move her. If you can bounce high, bounce for her too. Till she cry, lover, gold hatted, high bouncing lover, I must have you. I mean, and that's really what Gatsby does the whole book is he just like, if, if Daisy wants something, he does whatever he can to do it for her um, because he loves her. So uh, great, great epilogue. And then there's some uh, uh, epigraphs. Oh my gosh, I said epilogue again. Ah! There's some epigraphs that are before TV shows. Like um, if you've ever watched the show Alone, so good. It's like a survival show. Uh, extinction is the rule. Survival is the exception. I mean, the whole show is about like people trying to survive in the wilderness. And so each episode starts with one of these quotes and it kind of indicates some of the events that might happen uh, in that episode. So it's a really cool tool to kind of get your curiosity peaked and get you interested in the material. Whew, epistrophe. Oh, I don't have an animation for that. You don't get to guess. Sorry. <laughs> the repetition of word of a word at the end of a successive clause or sentence. Okay. So anaphora was at the beginning, like A is at the beginning of the alphabet. Epistrophe is the repetition at the end of a line. Okay. Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, no evil, no evil, no evil. Uh, uh, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Okay. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, the truth, the truth, the truth. Okay. That's epistrophe. And Lincoln, we talked about him for a sentence, but this little piece of his speech is also epistrophe of the people by the people for the people. Okay. Lincoln was just a good speaker, you guys. You just, we want to copy him. Okay. An appeal to ethics, morality, or authority. You know this one. Ethos. An appeal to logic. Logos, an appeal to emotion, pulling at the heartstrings, P for pulling at the heartstrings, pathos, pathos. These aren't in order on your paper, so you may have to kind of go through and hunt for them, but you can find them pretty easily. Go through and fill in those blanks. Okay, a mild or indirect word or expression substituted for one considered to be too harsh or blunt when referring to something unpleasant or embarrassing. Okay, that's a lot of words in this definition, but it's basically just like saying something nice instead of saying it meanly. Okay, uh, this is called a euphemism, a euphemism. E-U uh, is the Greek root for good. Okay, so let me show you some examples. Um, some people might call this a garbage man, but uh, a euphemism for garbage man might be a sanitation engineer. It's like a nicer way to say something that may come off a little harsh or might have a negative connotation. Okay, um, some people might call these old people, <laughs> um, but a more polite euphemism would be senior citizens. Okay, some people might say they died. Okay, which is fine, but probably a gentler way to say that is they passed away. Okay. Uh, some people might say she got knocked up. <laughs> That's what people would say if they're spilling the tea, right? Um, but really a more um, appropriate thing to say might be she's with child. Okay. And then uh, a lot of people would say this guy is getting fired. But um, the better way to say that if you're being polite is to use the euphemism being let go. Okay. All right, that's euphemism. We use those a lot. <laughs> Paint a picture in the mind of your audience, often by using the five senses. Oh, you know this. You know this. You know this. What is it? It's imagery. Did you get it? I bet you did. Okay. Um. Oh, okay. I'm going to just show you the words here. To suggest something in an indirect way. Hmm. What are you doing? If you suggest something in an indirect way, you're giving a hint. You are implying, okay? To suppose or come to a conclusion, especially based on an indirect suggestion, okay? This is taking a hint. That is to infer, okay? Imply is what you give, infer is what you take, okay? So if you look at this picture of this boy and this girl, um, he is giving her flowers. So maybe he's implying that he likes her, okay? He's giving her flowers and it looks like he's kind of blushing. So there is an implication there that he likes her, okay? Now, if she takes the flowers and says, hmm, he gave me flowers, so he must like me, then she is making an inference. She's taking the hint, 
Okay. He's implying that he likes her. She's inferring that he likes her. Okay. Let me show you another one. Oh man. <laughs> can you think of any implications or inferences you can make from this picture? Um, he's kind of implying that his armpit smells good, right? <laughs> like he looks like, yeah, enjoy it. <laughs> what? Um, and she is definitely implying to us, the viewer, that his armpit is stinky. Okay. We can make an inference based on her face that his armpit is stinky. Okay. Oh my, there's my animations again. <laughs> oh, okay. I like this one. Two things being seen or placed close together with contrasting effect. This is a long one, juxtaposition, okay? Now we've talked about this before. Um, the reason authors use juxtaposition is because it highlights a characteristic that you really, really want seen, okay? Um, this can be with color. Like for instance, in the movie Schindler's List, this girl is the only one in color the whole film. She's wearing a red coat. Um, and as a result, she really stands out. And we know that we're supposed to pay attention to her because she's important for some reason. Um, and the reason is that she's symbolic of something important. I'm not gonna give away too much, but you should watch Schindler's List, it's great. Um, so juxtaposition could be color. It could be weather. Okay. Like maybe one place is all sunny and the other place is rainy and stormy. Okay. Um, juxtaposition could be characters themselves. Now when characters are juxtaposed, that's called a foil. Okay. Um, and like I said, the reason we do this is so that you can really underline the differences that you're trying to, you're, to get your readers to notice. So let me give you an example of this with real life people. All right. This is Kevin Hart. He's a comedian and he's short. You know what short is, right? You've seen short. So, you know, if I say he's short, you're like, okay, he's short. Okay. This is Shaq. He's a basketball player. Um, and he's tall. You know what tall is? You're like probably picturing it in your head. Okay. So you get that Kevin Hart is short. Shaq is tall, but you're not really, really going to get my message until I put these two guys next to each other. Whoa. <laughs> Shaq is tall. Kevin Hart is short. Okay. Um, we do the same thing with characters, with colors, with weather, with settings, with all kinds of different things um, to really highlight to the reader the extreme contrast. Okay. If I want a character to look really, really, really nice, I'll put them next to someone who's really, really, really mean. Okay. If I want a character to look very, very honest, I will put them right next to a liar. Okay. Because just them being honest may not be enough for you to really get how honest they are. Okay. All right. Hmm. The use of negative terms to suggest a positive assertion or statement usually used to create an understatement. Okay. This is called litotes. Litotes. Okay. Um, and so here are some examples. You won't be sorry. If I just got a job, I just got hired. Like this man just got hired. He says, oh, you won't be sorry. I could say, you're going to be so happy you hired me. But that sounds weird. Maybe a little desperate, a little thirsty. I don't know. It sounds odd. Um, but instead, I can give the reassurance, you won't be sorry. Okay. Instead of saying, you're going to be so happy. I'm saying, you will not be sorry. That's a litote. Okay. Um, it's just kind of meant to be a little bit more of a, an understated, like downplayed, um, positive statement. Okay. Um, do you like the stress? I don't hate it. I don't hate it. Now, depending on the delivery, um, it could mean a lot of things, right? I don't hate it, right? Like that means like, I don't like it at all, but I don't despise it. Or you could be like, I don't hate it. <laughs> right. Like that means you, you probably like it pretty well. Okay. So it kind of depends on the delivery and the context. Barack Obama, the king of the not bad face, not bad, not too shabby, right? Okay, you could say, hey, that's good. But instead we say not bad, right? There's a different connotation. This is a, a way to give a different rhetorical meaning, okay? Um, how about it's not uncommon for people to spend their whole life, blah, 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 blah. Not uncommon. Instead of saying it is common, I'm saying it's not uncommon. That's a litote. Okay. Uh, this guy from Aladdin, remember him? This is no ordinary lamp. <laughs> Instead of saying, this is a special lamp. He says, this is no ordinary lamp. And he does that because basically he's saying, I know what you're thinking. 
you think this is a piece of junk, but it's not, right? Um, and so it's like a little more intriguing than just saying this is a special lamp. Okay, when he says this is a special lamp, it sounds like he's trying to convince us of something. Whereas when he says this is no ordinary lamp, it sounds like he's already smarter than us. He knows what we're thinking and he knows we're wrong, <laughs> right? A shark could swim faster than me, but I could probably run faster than a shark. So in a triathlon, it would all come down to who is the better cyclist. <laughs> um, you're not wrong, right? Instead of saying you're right, like, because that's an absurd statement. I want to be like, you're so right. Like, <laughs> I will say, hmm, you're not wrong. Okay. Malapropism. Mal meaning bad, approp meaning appropriate. Um, this is when you say something that is not um, appropriate for the context that you are trying to speak. Okay. What it really is, is a verbal blunder. It's when you say the wrong word because it sounds like the right word. <laughs> Okay, so let me give you an example. Um, people say all for not in OT. That's not correct. The actual phrase is all for not in A-U-G-H-T. Okay, when I was a kid, I always used to say, I'm a human being. I'm a human being because I did not realize that it was human being. <laughs> okay, um, oh, this, I, I just, I screenshotted this from Instagram. People saying hammy downs, hammy, like, like, with the essence of ham, instead of saying hand me downs, like these clothes are handed down to me. People saying hand me downs. Blah. Okay. Um, trespassers will be prostituted. Uh oh. Nope. <laughs> nope. Prosecuted. Prosecuted. Uh, Mike Tyson once said, I might just fade into Bolivian. Bolivian? A person from Bolivia? No, he meant to say oblivion. Okay. Uh, Mary had a little lamb. It's fleas were white as snow instead of it's fleece. Here are some more really common malapropisms. Um, people saying supposedly, no, that's not a thing. Supposedly for all intensive purposes. No, for all intents and purposes. Okay. Irregardless. No, 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 no regardless. Okay. I could care less. That means that you care a little. If you could care less, that means you care a little bit. So if you're trying to say, I don't care at all, you say, I couldn't care less. I could not care less about this. Okay. Um, espresso, no espresso Pacifically, like of the Pacific ocean. No, specifically X cetera. No, et cetera. That means and others, right? Or and more. Um, I seen it. <laughs> no, I saw it. Of utmost importance. No, not upmost, like the highest up. Utmost. Okay, that's just the correct word. Utmost importance. I need to lay down. No, you lay objects. Um, lie. People lie down. Okay. Here's the king of the malapropism, Michael Scott. Let's watch a few clips from him and see how many of the malapropisms he can catch. Webster's Dictionary defines wetting as the fusing of two metals with a hot torch. Pam, would you stand up for a sec? Mm. See how relaxed I am? I like this chair. Offers good support. It is ergonomically correct. The new Michael Scott. They are in for a bitter surprise. I am not to be truffled with. If I could leave you with one thought, remember, it wasn't me. They are trying to make me an escape goat. I'm not going. You did this, not us. Okay, no, you encouraged it. You were complicit. Complicit? You were all accessories. Michael. Oh, you're still here. I have your baguette. David, guess who I am sitting here dressed as? I'm not going to guess. You can tell me or I will hang up. I will give you a hint. His last name is Christ. He has the power of flight. He can heal leopards. Oh, 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 oh! Contraption! She's contrapting! Jim Albert is smudge and arrogant. I think he means smug. Arrogant. I am downloading some N3P That's music yeah. for a CD mixtape for Holly. Okay, let's talk about the next one. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, a word, name, or expression used as a substitute for something else with which it is closely associated. Okay, that's like, what are you talking about? This is called metonymy. Let me tell you what I mean by metonymy. Um, if I said Hollywood is up in arms about the most recent election, 
am I talking about a place? Hollywood, the the land, the hills, the trees, is they're up in arms about the latest election? No. When I say Hollywood is blah, 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 I'm referring to all of the movie stars that work at Holly, in Hollywood, right? So to call all those movie stars Hollywood is a metonymy, okay? If I say the White House just issued a press release, um, the house the building it did not do that it is inanimate okay the white house did not do that um i am referring to the people who work in the white house and usually more specifically i'm referring to the president okay so to call the president or the people who work in the white house the white house is a metonymy okay uh we often say wall street is doing this or wall street is doing that wall street closed early today wall street did this um we're not referring to the street Okay, we're referring to the people who work on Wall Street, stockbrokers, um, businessmen, different things like that. Uh, so that's Wall Street metonymy. Got it. Okay. Um, let's see. The reason a character acts, thinks, and speaks a certain way. I bet you know this one. Starts with an M. Ooh, why do you do that? It's my motivation. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you've ever watched The Princess Diaries, we, or not the princess diaries princess bride oh my gosh what is my malapropisms are on fire today okay um then you will remember that this guy uh when he was a kid a man with six fingers killed his father and so this kid grew up in his whole life he trained um in fencing and he thought of nothing but vengeance and he like that is his motivation that is why he gets up in the morning that is why he puts one foot in front of the other even though he is so sad about having lost his father so tragically he is motivated by the idea that someday he's going to find that six-fingered man and seek revenge okay that's motivation P.S. If you haven't watched The Princess Bride it is your homework okay I mean I can't make you watch it but like a little bit watch it okay uh you gotta spend money to make money hmm. the soul grows by subtraction not addition less is more interesting all of these statements seem to contradict themselves how is less more okay can you think of any ways that less is more think about it all right. Um, a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or true. Okay. This is called a paradox. Okay. You got to spend money to make money. Well, think about starting a business. It costs money to buy the building. It costs money to buy the equipment. It costs money to pay the employees. It costs money to do this and that and advertise everything else. But eventually you start making money, hopefully from the business. Okay, so you do have to spend money to make money in that situation. So even though it seems contradictory, this is a true statement. Okay, uh, the phrase addition by subtraction is very common. A lot of people use it when referring to companies um, and letting people go or firing people that are toxic to the company. They call it addition by subtraction. If we fire this toxic person, we are adding to our company by subtracting that person. So addition by subtraction seems really contradictory, but it's actually a paradox. Okay. Well, um, some paradoxes aren't explainable. Okay. They're unsolvable. The red button is false. Okay. The blue button is true. Uh-oh. This poses a problem. This poses a paradox. If the red button is false, then whatever it says can't be true. The red button says the blue button is true. Okay. Well, if the blue button is true, then the red button has to be false. But if the red button is false, then the blue button can't be true. Oh my gosh. <laughs> paradox. All right. If you choose to answer this question at random, what is the chance you will be correct? Well, there are four answer choices. So the answer is 25%. But uh-oh, look at the answer choices. Two of the answer choices say 25%. Ooh, so now that means that there's a 50% chance that uh, I can get the answer right. But now that it's 50, the answer has changed. So B, 50% is no longer correct because it's only one of the four answers. That's only 25% of the answers. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. All right, that's a paradox. I said, who killed him? And he said, I don't know who killed him, but he's dead, all right. And it was dark 
and there was water standing in the street and no lights or windows broke and boats a hole up in the town and trees blown down and everything all blown. And I got a skiff and went out and found my boat where I had her inside Mango Key. And she was right. Only she was full of water. Okay, this is a quote from After the Storm by Ernest Hemingway. Um, and this is a lot of the word and. Did you notice and, 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 and over and over again? Okay, this is the intentional repetition of conjunctions close together. Do you remember what that is? It's not a sentence. There's not zero conjunctions. There are many conjunctions. Polysyndeton. All right. In this case, the polysyndeton is being used because we want you to feel how stressed the speaker is. Did you feel stressed? Uh, and it was dark and there was water standing in the street and no lights or windows broken, boats all up in the town and trees blown down and everything all blown. And I got a skiff and went out and found my boat where I had her inside Mayoki and she was right, only she was full of water. Whew. You should feel anxiety like the speaker is feeling. <laughs> Okay. Um, you could also use polysyndeton, um, depending on the context, to convey like a childish or youthful speech. And I want a pony and a train and some blocks and a robot. Okay. Um, that all of those conjunctions make it sound like a child is speaking. So it really depends on the context. But polysyndeton can be a very useful way to build a narrative. All right. You should know what this is <laughs> just by looking at it. If you don't know what this is, memorize it right now. You should know, okay, it's the relationship formed in context, okay? There's the white circle between the author, the audience, and the text, okay? This is the rhetorical triangle. You need to understand that all of these things work together for a rhetorical purpose because if you don't have one of these things, if you're missing even one, your rhetorical purpose will really be undermined. Okay. Okay. The Late Show, The Glorious American, Babylon Bee, The Onion, Saturday Night Live, South Park. These are all um, examples of artful ridicule or folly. <laughs> Satire. Okay. It's um, making fun of something in hopes to send a message about it. So instead of just saying, this is so horrible and terrible and just like getting on a soapbox, you instead turn it into a joke and kind of making fun of it, uh, start making fun of it so that you can expose the problem or correct a problem. Okay. All of these shows do that. The way I remember this is um, Saturday Night Live. I think satire, satire day, night live. <laughs> Satire Day Night Live, you guys. Duh. <laughs> All right. Hmm. A character shares his or her thoughts aloud, even though no one is around to hear them. So they are solo on stage. To be or not to be, that is the question. Okay. Um, or if somebody is maybe like praying or talking to God, or they're talking to a person who's passed away, but is obviously like, not in the scene. They're not talking to like a ghost or an angel. They're just talking to the air. Okay. Um, or if you're Ursula, you're just thinking about how evil you are by yourself, just telling yourself how evil and bad you are. Okay. What a baddie you are. Um, this is called a soliloquy. Okay. You are solo and you are speaking to no one. Okay. Now, if you ever give a speech and you're the only person talking, but there are people around you, that's called a monologue. But if you're alone on stage or you're alone in the scene, that's a soliloquy. Okay. I love this one too. <laughs> a type of metonymy. Okay. Uh, when part of something is used to refer to the whole. Okay. Hmm. Anybody know? This is called synecdoche. Synecdoche. Okay. Synecdoche is when part of something is used to refer to the whole. For example, if I say the crown is coming to visit, you know that I'm not talking about like a piece of head jewelry, okay? I'm talking about the queen, <laughs> okay? The queen is coming to visit, but if I call her the crown, I'm using synecdoche because obviously she is more than just a crown, but the crown is what we used to refer to her as a whole. Uh, if I said, whoa, 
nice wheels. <laughs> um, obviously, I'm not just impressed by your wheels. I'm impressed by your entire car. Okay. There may be, I guess, a specific example where maybe you got new wheels. But if you pull up in a good car and someone says nice wheels, probably an older person, because that's kind of an older person phrase. Um, they're talking about the whole car. That's synecdoche. Okay. If you're talking to a mom and she's like, oh my gosh, I'm so overwhelmed. I've got three mouths to feed at home. <laughs> All right, you should just have three mouths sitting on the couch, just lips and tongue and teeth sitting on the couch. No, of course not. She has three children. The mouths to feed are the synecdoche. Um, it's a small part of the whole, which is a child. Okay. Um, some people refer to businessmen, um, lawyers, people in finance as suits. Okay. Because they're often wearing suits. And obviously they're not referring to just the clothing, they're referring to the person inside of the clothing. So that is synecdoche. And then um, my husband works in construction and oftentimes they refer to some of the workers as hands. Um, I hired a new hand today. He's great. He is such a good worker. Okay. Obviously I didn't just hire a hand like, hello, Mr. Hand reporting for duty. <laughs> okay. Of course not. He hired a person who is lending a helping hand, who is working with his hands um, and who is giving a hand. Okay. So a hand is a whole person but I'm using synecdoche, okay? All right, we know this one, tone. I'm sorry, <laughs> the animations are backwards, but that's okay. The author's attitude toward a subject. So you could have a formal tone, which you should in all of your academic papers, or you could have an informal tone, like, hey, bro dog, gee, homie, yo. <laughs> all right, um, you need to know what the proper context is to have formal versus informal tone. Okay. You can have an optimistic tone, like we can save the world or a pessimistic tone, like the pollution is overwhelming everything and we will never recover. <laughs> okay. Uh, you can have a sarcastic tone. Very impressive. Can't you see my excitement? Or you could have a funny tone or a serious tone. Um, you could be sincere or insincere. Usually insincerity is accidental. People don't really like insincerity and they're not convinced by it. That's for sure. Um, so maybe you want to give someone else an insincere tone, like if you're writing a story, but you never want to give yourself an insincere tone. Uh, okay. This is something, let me see, <laughs> my buttons are in the way, something recurring across a genre or type of literature. Okay. This is typically specific to a genre or culturally specific. Okay. So you may be like, that sounds kind of like archetype, but this is specific to a genre or specific to a culture. Archetypes, they span all the cultures, all the time periods. Okay. Um, all the genres you find heroes and you find lovers, you find these in everything. Okay. These are very much more specific and they're usually more like stereotypes. Okay. This is called a trope. Um, so for example, I grew up in the 90s and a lot of 90s sitcoms, this drives me crazy, had the idiot husband. The husband was so dumb. Everything he said was so stupid. He was always like making mistakes and the the wife was always having to kind of almost mother him like he was another one of her children. Um, very common trope. I'm glad that that one's kind of dying out. So dumb. <laughs> Equally toxic, the nagging wife uh, where you have the husband that's like just trying to live his life and the wife's like me, 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 me. And they'd actually do this. Me, 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 me. And uh, just like super negative <laughs> negative feelings about marriage. Um, mean popular girls, right? Not all popular girls are mean, right? Not all mean girls are popular. Uh, the basic white girls, right? They've all got their their matching boots and, and drinking their Starbucks and they love fall and pumpkins, right? Um, kind of like these are a lot of these are negative. You can have positive tropes, but that one is particularly negative, probably a little racist, I would say too. But um, yeah, those would be tropes. See how these are like very culturally specific. Okay. You have like tropes that are specific to genres. Like if you're an anime person, there are certain types of characters that you get in anime that you don't really get anywhere else, but you know, the types of characters that you get. Okay. Um, that are like really special to that genre. Um, another trope would be like a moody teen, like, oh, I'm so moody and broody and emo. Like, obviously not every teen is like that, but um, you see that portrayed a lot. That's a trope or the dumb jock. Okay. These are some non-English words that you should know. Okay. This should still be on the same page of your workbook. So keep filling these in. The first one is bon appetit. 
it means good appetite, literally. Um, but figuratively, it means enjoy your meal. Mwah. Bon appetit. Bon meaning good, appetit meaning appetite. <laughs> a lot of these words are French. We use French a lot in daily language. This is called um, carte blanche. Carte blanche, okay? Uh, it literally means card that is blank, okay? A blank card. Um, it, it's complete freedom to act as you wish or as you think is best, okay? So let me give you an example. Um, if I hired a contractor and I just gave him a blank check and said, I want you to redo the bathroom and I just gave him a blank check. I'm giving him carte blanche to do whatever he wants, okay? If your manager says, hey, complete this task, um, I'm not going to give you any kind of input or restrictions. I just want you to get it done. They're giving you carte blanche. They trust you to do what you think is best. Okay. And this is a very often used phrase. Okay. A warning or proviso um, of specific stipulations, conditions, or limitations. It's the catch or the fine print. This is called a caveat. And the way I remember that is that it's the catch and C-A-C-A. -C -A. All right. So, for example, here's a 25% off coupon, but we've got this asterisk and all of this fine print about what circumstances the 25% applies to. Okay. Um, that's the caveat. All right. I might say, you all automatically get a 100 in this class. Well, that sounds great. You say, what's the caveat? <laughs> you get a 100% if you work hard and get every question right on every assignment. <laughs> it's a pretty big caveat. Okay. Oopsies. I'm not in my, there we go. Oh, this is so great. Step of two, a literal or metaphorical dance between two people. Um, this is called pas de deux. Pas de deux, step of two, okay? Um, if you've watched, uh, I think it's, what's the name of it? Shang-Chi, Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings. Um, it's the newest, well, right now, depending on whatever you're watching this video, it's one of the newer Marvel movies. Um, oh my gosh, so good. But there is a part in the beginning where these two characters meet and they're like kind of fighting, but they're also kind of falling in love. And so it's like done in this dance. Um, that's a pas de deux. They're dancing, a dance of two. Okay. Uh, a pas de deux can also be metaphorical. So maybe like you have like a really flowing conversation, like really witty. Um, it's often romantic in nature, like a very nice repartee back and forth. That's a pas de deux. Okay. It's a metaphorical dance, dance of words. Okay. Quid pro quo, a favor or advantage granted or expected in return for something. Okay. So basically it's you scratch my back and I will scratch yours. Okay. Um, this can be used in everyday language. Quid pro quos are pretty common and basically like, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. Okay. Um, quid pro quo sometimes has a negative connotation because it's been used to describe um, sexual harassment like maybe a professor approaches a student and says, I see you've got a low grade. I'll give you a high grade if you give me some kind of romantic behavior in return, um, a quid pro quo, okay? Obviously that would be really unethical and totally skeezy, um, but some people describe that kind of sexual harassment as a quid pro quo. But just know that you could use quid pro quo in a positive connotation and people would understand what you mean. It's not always bad. All right. And finally, tête à tête, head to head. Okay. I wanted to show you how it's written and I'd like for you to write it correctly in your notes, because if you do the Quizlet uh, exercises where you have to type it in, I didn't put any of the accent marks because it's hard to type quickly and put these accents in there. Um, but this is the correct way to write it. Tête with the circumflex over the E and A uh, with the accent grave over the A. Um, it means head to head. Um, and it's just kind of like we're putting our heads together. We're thinking this through together. Head to head, meeting of the minds. Okay, we're thinking this through. All right. Any questions? I don't know why I ask you that when it's a video, but if you have any questions, send me a comment, okay? Or send me a message. I want to answer them. All right, and that is literary terms.
terms. I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope you practice diligently because these are really valuable terms for you to know um, for English class and really for life so that you can identify what you're looking at. And um, when you can identify it, you can evaluate it and you can make wiser decisions. All right. I will see you in class. Bye.